The theme of today's event is evaluation, environment, and sustainable development. And we will feature a book published in 2000, can you see that? 2004, by Ruth Latch, titled Evaluating Environment in International Development. We are very pleased to have the editor and the two of the contributors of the book here. They and our commentator, who is also an, an experienced evaluator, will discuss why and how evaluation contributes to environment and sustainable development and challenges state. We will have our question and answer session at the end following the presentation and also record today today's event. And uh, as you can see, we have many participants online joining us, and uh, this is exciting. We look forward to your participation during the Q&A session. And please stay with us, don't fall asleep. So please also, when the presentation starts, unmute your mic so we can hear only the presenter's voice. And then our first speaker is Yuha Yutu. He is the director of the Just Independent Evaluation Office and the editor of the book, Evaluating Environment in International Development. You hide now sitting in his office in Washington, D.C., as you can see here on the screen. And you have career has combined positions in international organizations and academia. He has worked at UNDP, UA University, ESAC, and Nordic Africa Institute, and has held visiting academic positions at Rutgers, Kyoto University in Japan, and the University of Montana. A geographer by training, he's always been fascinated by human-environment interactions, natural resources management, and environmental hazards. Over the past decade and a half, he has uh, conducted and managed a large number of programmatic and thematic evaluations of international cooperation at the global, regional, and country levels, in particular related to environmental management and poverty environmental linkages. He has published widely on related topics. In October 2012, the European Evaluation Society awarded his paper on environmental evaluation for distinguished contribution to evaluation practice. Yuha also holds a PhD in geography. Today, Yuha will talk about the global environmental challenges and the role of evaluation. So Yuha, the online microphone is yours now. Thank you very much, Jean, and, and um, um, I guess it's up to me now to um, live up to the promise that um, keeps the people awake. Um, I would first um, uh, like to start by thanking the UNEG, and, and in particular you, uh, Jean, for organizing this seminar and, and or webinar and, and actually pushing me to get, actually get it done. We've been talking about it for a long while, but um, uh, but uh, things get busy. Okay, let me say a few words of, of um, uh, introduction about uh, this book and about the topic of environmental evaluation. As we know, the whole world talks about sustainable development and the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, are now coming to an end and, and they will be replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, then. As we know, the concept of sustainable development is supposed to uh, denote development today that doesn't compromise the ability of the future generations to develop their own world. Now, it's soon 23 years since the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit that was intended to um, operationalize sustainable development. And the world is still struggling with the notion of sustainable development and how to reach there and how to measure progress, which obviously is basically our uh, job in the evaluation field. Okay, now I'm trying to move this. Okay, here it is. Yeah. So what kind of a development do we actually need that meets these criteria of uh, meeting today's and future generations' needs. We commonly think that sustainable development encompasses economic, social, and environmental sustainability. What I'm focusing on here is the environment that we all, all depend on. Um, some people 
argue, and, and you hear this argument quite often, that um, with economic development also environmental problems are mitigated. And in many ways this argument is at the heart of the concept of sustainable development. Uh, we also hear how environmental pollution takes a toll on human health and the economy, for example, through lost productivity. Um, there is, of course, some truth to this argument, and, and, and in our societies, especially in the richer Western countries, um, as we have gotten richer, many of our local pollution problems have been reduced. Yet, while we have solved many of the local environmental problems, we have continued to perpetuate the global environmental problems. So, for example, we are now facing what has been termed the sixth extinction, a loss of species at a rate that has not taken place ever during the time that we humans have inhabited the planet. A quarter of all mammals are under threat of disappearing from the face of Earth. For other species, the situation can be even grimmer. Take, for example, the fact that six out of the seven species of marine turtles are on the verge of extinction. And this extinction, the sixth extinction, is almost entirely due to human activities. There's many reasons. Deforestation uh, caused by conversion of lands for agriculture, forest to mono monoculture, industrial sites and settlements, destroys habitats and modifies ecosystems that thus become hostile to a large number of species, large and small. Land lost under highways and transportation infrastructure not only takes uh, space, but also fragments habitats so that wildlife cannot survive. What we all consume daily contributes to this, of course. Here's an interesting piece of statistics, if you haven't heard it, pay, pay attention. Some 80% of deforestation globally is caused by the production of three commodities only palm oil, soybeans, and beef. And the situation obviously is not much better on the high seas. Three-fourths of the world's fisheries are considered to be either fully exploited or overexploited. There is also a major problem with the acidification of oceans. And of course, there is climate change, which is in many ways the poster boy of global environmental degradation and may well in the future become truly the biggest challenge to human existence. And many, many people, of course, argue that it already is. You know, ask anyone living in a low-lying low small island state that is being usurped by rising seas, battered by increasing storms, and whose water supplies are salinized by seawater. For them, sustainable development is a matter of life and death, and they are the first victims of global environmental problems that they themselves hardly contributed to. Both mitigation of climate change and adapt adapting to its impacts is very expensive and will divert resources from other important causes. Now, Although global environmental issues receive a lot of attention these days, it becomes obvious when we are making so little, why we are making so little headway when you look at the financial flows. Drawing on the results of the fifth overall performance evaluation of the GEF, the total funding for environmental issues from public sources amounts to approximately $10 billion a year, of which we at the GEF uh, uh, receive and distribute about one billion. But it has been estimated that um, the need for addressing global environmental issues would be ten times that. But then when you compare it with the public subsidies uh, that lead to overexploitation of natural resources and environmental degradation, which are actually amounting to yet another order of magnitude large, larger amount of money, it's not, it's not difficult to see why the environmental trends continue to sink. So the point is that whatever we do and whatever we fund for the environment should 
therefore be focused and effective. And this is where evaluation comes in. Evaluation has in recent years become more and more powerful in determining not only that the projects and programs that we implement are doing what they set out to do and spending taxpayers' money efficiently, but more importantly, that we actually are making a difference in people's lives and in the global environment. Evaluation approaches and methodologies are constantly being refined and, and they become increasingly rigorous. However, environmental evaluation has some challenges that are specific to it, uh, partly because environmental issues are exceptionally complex and, and uh, there is a poverty environment development nexus that is hard to crack and that has many dimensions. The challenges include uh, the often long time frames of environmental phenomena. Interventions with environmental goals seldom have equally long time frames and can only be evaluated on their outcomes and potential of setting things on a path that will eventually lead to real environmental impacts if several other things beyond the interventions materialize and no unforeseen threats arise. Similarly, there is, a theor uh, there is the issue of geographical scale, which often differs from the boundaries of the intervention. Watersheds are divided between jurisdictions. Transboundary conservation puts strains on cooperation and so forth. There are also challenges with data availability, quality and credibility. There are specific issues pertaining to research designs that pose challenges for assessing attribution of environmental change to the policies and programs. Andy Rove, who will uh, speak after me, uh, has suggested a dual evaluant approach to overcome some of these issues, but I'll, let, let, um, I'll leave it to Andy to elaborate later. There, is also, there are also new risks and uncertainties. Climate change has thrown a curveball into the game and suddenly old models don't apply. Uncertainty, risk, tipping points rule. We need to think carefully about what this means to evaluation and how we build in these factors into our approaches and methodologies when we are evaluating at any level policies, programs, strategies, projects. Also, I mean, evaluation is an interesting word because it, it is almost the same as valuation. And, and I think there's a, obviously a connection. To me, evaluation is not value-free. Whatever policy, strategy, program, project, or intervention we evaluate, we evaluate from a value perspective. Fundamentally, if we agree with the goals of the intervention, then that forms the value bottom line against which we evaluate. Yet in practice, this is not so easy to determine. And this is particularly true again when it comes to environmental evaluation. One of the fundamental issues in sustainable development pertains to trade-offs. If the goal of sustainable development is to make people's lives better while at the same time preserving the environment and the other non-human lives on the planet, the goals, at least in the short term, are not always compatible. How do you weigh the relative value of, say, a flush toilet to a thousand families uh, with the horn and life of an endangered white rhino? Um, what if Instead of the flush toilet, the comparison concerns a flat screen TV or two for a household. How do we go, how far do we go to satisfy the human needs and desires at the cost of dwindling biodiversity? Environmental economists have made a lot of progress in setting monetary value to a variety of things such as ecosystem services in the hope that making a rational economic argument would convince people to change their behavior. Let me take one example, which I think is very good. 
A case has been recently made that the value of sharks, which are largely consisting of ind endangered species, as tourism attraction is now approaching their value as sources of shark fin for the soups of wealthy consumers in Hong Kong and around the world. I hope the shark fishermen and, and the diners as well hear this message loud and clear and very soon. Still to me personally, the economic argument is not a uh, sufficient one. I cannot place monetary value on life, whatever its form. If the world loses its last shark or rhino or wood bug, anything, that is an irre irreplaceable loss. Apart from the fact that we don't even know how such a loss would affect ecosystem integrity, and I mentioned the tipping points earlier. But apart from that, life and the diversity of life to me has, an, has intrinsic value. But how does one build these perspectives into evaluation is challenging. However, I believe that evaluators have a responsibility to think about such questions. Now to the book. I embarked on doing it in order to clarify some of these issues and to bring together cutting-edge work and research in the field of environmental evaluation in an international context in order to benefit the practice and ultimately to enable us to use evaluation to better define what works, in what contexts, and for whom in devising interventions to help the environment that provides us with uh, provides us all our sustenance. The volume is divided into three main sections. The first sets the scene. It consists of three essays, including my introduction, which is a variety of which you are hearing right now. And then there's two strategic chapters by Rob Vandenberg in which he argues for evaluating environment from the point of view of public goods and Howard Stewart hi highlighting the importance of placing environment into the context of development and people's aspirations. The second section focuses on approaches and challenges of the environment as the evaluant. It contains five chapters starting with Andy's exploration of the principles of evaluating sustainable development interventions. And it then ends with, a, with an interesting chapter on evaluating normative work on the environment by Segbesi Nordby and Mike Spilsbury. This is, I mention it because much of our evaluation focuses so much on programs and projects that it's important to bear in mind that we have to develop approaches to evaluating normative work as, as well. Then the final section of the book highlights lessons from international cooperation through eight distinct case studies and Vijay Vadivelu's work, which he will be talking about today on evaluating climate change and disaster risk reduction, is an important contribution uh, in this respect. The authors highlight different approaches to evaluation. What is common to many is variations of the so-called theory-based approach to evaluation. We use the theory of change or logic model, whatever word you want to use, to understand how interventions are designed and intend to achieve their often lofty goals. Uh, there are also examples of impact evaluation where rigorous quasi-experimental designs are used to tease out the effects and impact of a specific intervention. Some of the directions emerging from reflection on environmental evaluation pertain to the need for moving away from evaluating individual interventions to evaluating the environment and development outcomes and impact. We have to keep our eye on the big picture and whether we are actually making a difference or are we just tinkering at the margins. Given the complexities, the differing time and geographical scales, the data challenges, everything that I mentioned earlier, there is a clear need for putting together multidisciplinary teams and utilizing mixed methods for data collection and analysis. For instance, the joint evaluation by the GEF and UNDP independent evaluation offices of the effectiveness of protected areas and protected area systems in biodiversity conservation 
that is now in its final phase has effectively combined a variety of methods ranging from remote sensing to map forest cover change and global databases for tracking wildlife abundance change uh, to quasi-experimental methods and further uh, to interviews and field visits for verification. This brings me to the maybe my final point about big data and technologies such as remote sensing and GIS, geographical information science, which I believe can truly help us to see patterns and to track impacts on the ground. They are, however, not a panacea, and more qualitative approaches are definitely needed to identify causalities, to understand why things happen, and, and to, to really grasp uh, the specifics of each case. Now, on the context, 2015 is an important year for both the environment and for evaluation. Several large international events take place this year. In March, just a couple of months ago, there was the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Sendai, Japan. In November, there will be the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, which is expected to come up with a successor agreement to the Kyoto Protocol. In between, in September, the nations are supposed to agree on the Sustainable Development Goals. And these Sustainable Development Goals have been, um, have been designed with a lot of uh, emphasis on targets and measurable indicators. But what we evaluators have advocated for is to go beyond monitoring and in indicators and build in evaluation into the SDG processes so that we may better understand what is happening and why. What are the causalities that foster or the barriers that hamper the achievement of the goals? Indicators are fine and they are definitely needed, but they don't tell the whole story. Evaluation helps us to go beyond them and to understand causalities. Now, evaluation is gaining traction on the international scene, I would say. Last year, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution on national evaluation capacity development, essentially to promote the use of evaluation, especially in the developing countries. And this year, 2015, in case you have missed it, has also been declared the International Year of Evaluation. I sincerely hope that you will all enjoy this webinar and the book, of course, and find them useful in your professional and academic careers and practice. I would very much like to thank all of the contributors who have been and continue to be such inspirations to me personally. I look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuha. And I'm sure we're going to have quite many questions and uh, would take all of them at the end. And for online audience, if you have any questions, you can type, it, type them in the chat section or let us know you, have, you want to raise the question uh, yourself. Our next speaker is uh, Andy Rowe. And Andy, can we see him now on the screen? Andy, where are you? <laughs> yes. Okay, let me just introduce him first and then he will show up for later, I believe. So Andy has worked for over 30 years as an economist and evaluation consultant. His work focuses on evaluation in sustainable development, natural resource, and dispute resolution settings. He has a PhD from the London School of Economics and is a 2013 fellow and former president of the Canadian Evaluation Society. Mm -hmm. His contributions to evaluation journals and books have emerged from his experience as an evaluation practitioner. And today, Andy will talk about the challenges of evaluating at nexus of human and natural systems. So Andy, over to you now. Okay. I, I'm here, uh, but I don't see my slides up yet. Can you hear me? Uh, Andy, can you click on the tab that says Andy Unig at the top? Thank yes, you. I can. There we go. Thank you. 
And uh, thank you all for joining this webinar and for the invitation for me to join it. And obviously, thanks to those who are managing the technology against my efforts to subvert it. Um, I'm going to elaborate on some of the uh, key themes in, in the chapter uh, that I contributed to the book. And the, the chapter is titled Evaluation at the Nexus. We um, we we generally speak of the nexus as where the human and natural systems connect and inevitably affect each other. And the concept comes from a UNDP evaluation, I believe, in 2010. And Yuha has mentioned that our focus is really on sustainable interventions, which is uh, management of the connection between the two systems, that is, managing the connection at the nexus, to ensure that the present and future needs of, uh, or the needs of present and future generations can be met. Um, the concept of two system evaluants, which I introduced a couple of years ago in the American Journal of Evaluation, has been mentioned by Yuha. He's referred to them as dual evaluants, which might be a better way to, to present them. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about connectivity, because connectivity is one of the most useful tools that we have uh, in evaluation. It's one that has come recently to evaluation from, from the natural sciences, from ecology, largely, and uh, which is highly underdeveloped within evaluation. And uh, that itself connects to the intellectual capacity that we have in evaluation for conducting evaluation at the nexus uh, and of environmental matters. Now, nexus evaluants, and an evaluant is the subject of an evaluation, what, what we're actually uh, evaluating, and it might be a program or a project or, or a policy, um, national strategy. And it might well, as you have said, uh, and as Mike Spilsbury, Spilsbury said in his chapter, uh, involve normative products. Many of the evaluations, many of the interventions that we evaluate or should be evaluating engage both human and natural systems. And as I said, as we said, this is, these are nexus connections, which occur where the human and natural systems are coupled. And coupled is a phrase from ecology a little stronger than connected, uh, because there can be many and often very complicated interactions amongst the systems at these coupling points. And it's the coupling points where the human and, and natural systems uh, affect each other um, for good and not so good uh, ways. Sustainable development is generally a nexus intervention. And so evaluation of the SDGs will usually occur at the nexus. Natural resource management and climate change are two more examples. And as you have said, these are, these are uh, preeminently important uh, program policy areas that uh, are on the public policy agenda and need to, need to get even more attention. The systems, uh, as you have said, uh, the natural systems and human systems usually operate at different scales. And as he said, the spatial scale for the human system might be a nation, a province, or a state, or a resource management jurisdiction. For the natural system, the spatial scale might be an ecosystem or a binome. And the spatial scales of a human system rarely align with those of a natural system. Even the spatial scales of human system, that is uh, aspects of the human system that are managing, responsible for managing the human system, hardly ever align with the spatial scales of the natural system that they are managing. Likewise, temporal scales differ. Humans are generally less patient than natural systems, and importantly, evaluation occurs within the human scale. And that is often before changes in the natural system have begun to assert themselves. And that is part of the reason that the coupling of the human and natural system is often missed in evaluation and in programs because the temporal scales are so different and the spatial scales are so different that if you're evaluating from the human system, you just don't notice the change or the connection to the natural system. 
Nexus settings uh, present some challenges for evaluation. We can think of some of our methods as designed to quiet some of the moving parts, some of the parts that are moving in the intervention, so that we can focus on those that we are most interested in. Basically, the moving parts create a lot of noise that we want to control so that we can look at what at the outcomes or the results that we're interested in. I'll give you a brief example. If one of our dogs has a sore paw that is moving about, then we need her to be still so that we can examine the injured paw. But what if the dog, uh, what if our dog is in a field of bunnies that are hopping around? Well, that makes it very hard to quiet the dog. And first we have to quiet the bunnies before we can quiet the dog so that we can look at the paw. Uh, so this quieting uh, of, of activities and, and the noise that is around and other effects is, is really essential. And it's a lot of evaluation uh, methods uh, focus on, on how we can, uh, how can we bring quiet to, this, this, to the context. In evaluation, we might be interested in a local marine management intervention, which is intended to improve food security. But the communities also harvest from the land and the forest. Other forces might be influencing their management of marine and other resources, for example, fisheries policy or enforcement. Poachers might become active, or there might be some compelling reason for the community to hold a ceremonial harvest that is not not compliant with the management intent. All of these forces are like a wiggling dog, and we need to hold them quiet while we look at the connection between food security and the intervention. Evaluation the nexus simply has more and very different moving parts and needs to address in interventions and changes at multiple scales compared to a single system evaluation. And where the two systems are coupled, movement in one system affects the other and often feeds back into the first system. And this is what underlies uh, uh, the, what we often claim to be the more complex setting for evaluation at nexus or environmental setting. Most evaluation approaches and methods are designed for a single system setting. The implication of nexus evaluation is that we need to adapt or develop new methods for evaluation and also adjust our expectations and the expectations of users of the evaluation to accept the limitations of evaluation at the nexus. I want to flag the use of contribution analysis rather than attribution as an illustration. Uh, and uh, it, I described uh, contribution briefly on this on the slide. And the Jeff Evaluation Office employs Contribution Office. Um, and we often see it in policy evaluation settings, for example, under the Canadian National Evaluation Policy. Now I want to move on to connectivity. And uh, perhaps the, my next few comments will be unusual for an evaluation setting, but I hope they I hope they remain on point. When we're looking at coupled systems, connectivity is a key concept for us to deploy in evaluation. And I'm going to spend some time illustrating how using connectivity can connect seemingly unconnected activities and settings and take us to important observation because connectivity takes us on a pathway that is open to both systems, human and natural systems, and provides a lens we can use to see where they couple and what happens there. Connections can be broken, uh, created, or established. And we can see this in the photo on the slide. The bridge suggests a road, uh, which means that we have established a connection across the river uh, for our own use, and it traverses the, the river and addresses the priorities in the human system. We need to be able to drive across the river, ride horses across the river. The stream is the road or passage for aquatic life. The stream is there flowing under the bridge, such as, light, as fish that might have moved up the river to spawn in earlier times. But as you can see, the aquatic roadway is blocked, and all natural systems functions that rely on passage up and down the stream are disconnected and can no longer occur. 
an evaluator looking at this and who is attempting to understand the activity between human and natural system at this site should be able to see the priorities that are in place in the site and how one system is impaired by the actions of the other. For example, stream blocking debris occurs more, most often where there is an opportunity for humans to discard or where there is a snag such as narrowing of the stream, both of which occur here in this photograph. This is a microscopic nexus. If we are evaluating transport, human transport, we should not overlook the connectivity of transport infrastructure to the natural system and how it is impaired, how it can impair the natural system. But now I want to take you to a surprising place. I want to talk about how cats connect to climate change and actually cats contribute to climate change. I acknowledge that cats and climate change seem quite a reach but not, and not the norm for evaluation venues. But it is conveniently abstracted from our likely evaluation worlds that it aids in fostering the concept, understanding of the concept of connectivity. And I want to use this to illustrate how seemingly disparate things can connect to bring about results or changes that matter, and how unlikely it would be to envision this from the outset. Consider something done at the outset, a survey asking people about climate change. How many of you might pick cats as a cause or contributor to climate change? Yet in some locations, for example, the west coast of North America, human and natural systems connect, rendering cats a non-trivial contributor to climate change, and that it's resulted in state policies and rules and specific site-specific interventions. As you can imagine, cat lovers are not the heroes of this story. I'm sure that you can imagine this to be a topic that could cause controversy in some settings. So here's the story about cats and climate change. The photos and captions are fairly self-explanatory, and I invite you to read them. We start with humans creating and, patron and patronizing domesticated cats. Observe that they, cats, especially feral cats, take an astonishing number of birds, estimated to be 40% of North American songbirds annually. And they also take wildlife, some of which we welcome and some we don't, for example, rats. But the birds especially have a parasite. Now, I have trouble pronouncing the name of the parasite, but it's there on the screen. And having entered cats through, uh, through the mouth when cats ingest birds, the parasites grow in number, and they leave by millions through the other end. Now, a feral cat tends to distribute these parasites across the landscape, sometimes in places that connect the waterways street pavement or near streams. For domesticated cats, litter is a form of public transport for these parasites. Litter is flushed down toilets or disposed in landfills or just discarded. And this is a vehicle that connects the parasites to water flows, such as, again, storm drains and sewers, or runoff from landfills. These connect to waterways, many leading to the sea, and in the sea, it becomes a problem since filter feeders, things like crabs, mussels, sea urchins, ingest the parasite. And the, the, uh, the biology or the, uh, the, the physiology of filter feeders is that they concentrate these parasites. And this concentrating process is part of the reason we sometimes uh, see, see bans on, on eating sh shellfish. But from the point of view of climate change, I'm sorry, my slides aren't advancing. So this is the, the slide that should have, you should have just seen. So the cats who use the kitty litter, the litter goes down through toilets and other waterways. It gets ingested by these filter feeders and concentrated in these filter feeders. The nature of the food chain means that filter feeders will be consumed by something. And of interest to us, is that sea otters love to eat filter feeders, and sea otters tend to cluster at, at these outflows uh, where the parasites uh, are, are entering the system and being consumed by, by the filter feeder. And while the parasite is not particularly harmful to filter feeders, it certainly is to sea otters. It attacks their brains, and their fondness for filter feeders ends up killing them. Connectivity doesn't end here. We don't want to make a big thing about sea otters. Uh, but 
the harmful travel of the parasites does not uh, does not stop since they uh, here stop because they pass they do not pass on from sea otters. They expire with the death of the, of the new host. But sea otters are the gardeners of seagrass beds and underwater grass meadows. They eat the main predators on seagrasses, such as sea urchins. Another stressor of seagrasses arrives at this nexus because of a different connectivity to the human system. Algae that grow on seagrass because the same water systems that carry the parasites also carry nitrogen discharge from our use of fertilizer. Nitrogen promotes growth of algae, which is very harmful to seagrass habitat. And this is where it all connects. Without the sea otters uh, eating the predators, the urchins and other predators and the algae consume the seagrasses that are already stressed by the algae, so that the area of healthy seagrass meadow diminishes greatly. And Wonder of wonders, seagrass beds are remarkably effective at capturing carbon, much more effective and much more efficient than the trees on which we spend billions to retain their capture. Based on recent calculations, the presence of otters increased the carbon storage on Pacific Coast kelp beds by 4.4 to 8.7 megatons. That's the equivalent of the amount of carbon found in the annual carbon dioxide emissions from three to six million passenger cars. So I hope you found this, uh, this example interesting. And I think you can see that it's, the connectivity is actually a very powerful concept that allows us to bring together disparate, disparate uh, effects and occurrences and activities and connect them to something that is very important to us. So in this story, we have connected one system you are likely familiar with, fertilizes oxygen or nitrogen and the bad effects on water, intersecting with another system you likely did not hear about before today with the result of non-trivial negative effects on carbon sequestering. I'm not suggesting that kitty litter or storm and sewage systems need to enter into all our evaluation. The story is intended to illustrate how obscure connectivity uh, can be. And if we do not look, it is hidden. If we don't look for the connectivity, we don't pursue connectivity, then the connection of the human system to the natural system will not appear, largely because of the differences in scale of temporal and spatial frames. So we miss the importance of the nexus, and we cannot incorporate sustainability into evaluation. So what is the connectivity? What is the role of connectivity and contemporary evaluation? I suggest you consider the concept of unrestricted theories of change. Normally, our theories of change are restricted by the boundaries of the specific intervention we are evaluating. This is not just, as we usually phrase it, context or intended and unintended effects, which is where we usually assign uh, things that lie outside the boundaries of theory of change. I've illustrated a direct line from the nexus of cats and nitrogen to climate change. Connectivity is the intellectual construct that will conduct our travel from causes to effects. Connectivity is, in fact, one of the most powerful, most underemployed constructs in evaluation. Apologies, I work at home and I forgot about our phone. I'll give you one example. We've developed governance structures that have become risk averse by externalizing the hard stuff. So in a, in a governance structure, accountability structures, accountability structures uh, uh, connect to our performance indicators, our performance management structures. And if as a manager you want to do well, you want to minimize or constrain your risk by having achievable performance management structures. So you, the boundaries of, of government structures are, are set. But these boundaries, the, uh, what they do is they end up partitioning uh, our intervention. And, along, uh, and they partition our interventions in ways that mean that our governance structures often don't connect to the public interest. And therefore, an intervention in the human system is often not seen as connecting 
to the natural system. In other words, uh, our, by partitioning uh, our interventions into cost units or accountability units, we don't reach to the public interest. We don't reach to the nexus intervention. And connectivity is a concept that helps us reconstruct partitioned interventions to each other and to the public interest. It also enables us to view an evaluation settings uh, as as nexus setting when previously they were viewed as single uh, human system settings unconnected to the natural system. And this is critical because as Yuha pointed out, the public sector invests much more against rather than in favor of sustainability. Evaluation is part of governance. I suggest that we lo lose a part of our evaluation function by acquiescing in, in this partitioning in the silos in accepting the silos as a frame for the intervention that we're going to uh, to evaluate. And connectivity is the vehicle that we can use to reconnect to the public and larger interest. Finally, I want to consider our capacity for nexus intervention. Our evaluation infrastructure and evaluation for nexus settings is not nearly good, good enough. We do have capacities such as the important nodes that Jeff and UNEP evaluation offices or where it's required by law or policy. The climate eval effort is another notable uh, contribution. And the uh, federal, the national evaluation policy in Canada has actually had the, had the effect of requiring that departments such as the Department of Environment, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, or what reminds, remains development agencies in Canada have evaluation uh, capacity. And that capacity includes operating at the nexus. Compare this to the U.S., where the evaluation office for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has once again been directed away from evaluation, or where the Department of the Interior, with 85,000 plus employees, effectively has no evaluation office as function, yet it's responsible for forests, public lands, uh, uh, fish, fish and wildlife. And then compare this to education or health, with large, who, where we see very large evaluation capacity, both within and outside government and the multilateral uh, uh, development agency. We could discuss this more, but for evaluation at the nexus, there are very few contributions to theory. There are few, if any, academic positions or programs. There are few practitioners with experience at the nexus, and most of the nexus evaluation work, uh, or much of it is done by science folk with little or no knowledge of evaluation. And leading international organizations value natural sciences over social sciences and evaluation. This is why the, the book is so important, because it is, it is one of the few contributions we have to the intellectual infrastructure of conducting evaluation at the nexus. I want to conclude with a few comments. Our, our, our work at the Nexus offers great, offers great promise for evaluation. By bringing and highlighting connectivity, we can stimulate and stretch existing evaluation approaches and methods to suit more complex and multi-system settings. We can demonstrate the need for and benefits of incorporating concepts from other sciences into evaluation and expose the need to adapt standards and expectations for evaluation. But it requires much more work, such as on methods and approaches, as well as when conducting evaluations of nexus settings. We need to improve our intellectual foundation to be able to evaluate the SDGs, climate change, and other nexus settings. If we do not do this, then one or the other system is likely to be ignored, either the human and natural system and to be poorly attended to in these evaluations. And evaluation will be not, not meeting its professional responsibility. So I want to commend you, Ha, and UNDP for, for organizing this book, and thank you for inviting me to join in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And actually, Andy, both Andy and you have presentation will also posted them uh, online. So you can check that, uh, you can find that on the UNEP website. And uh, we still have two more speakers, so please stay with us. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> our, next, our next speaker is uh, Vijaya Lakshmi 
I'm sorry, <laughs> but Evalu. Vijaya is the evaluation advisor at the Independent Evaluation Office of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. She has managed, managed and carried out a number of evaluations of development and crisis-related programs at the global and country levels. Prior, prior to joining UNDP, she carried out applied research on governance issues and gender equality in development at the Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore, uh, Bangalore India. Vijaya holds a PhD in sociology, and today she will talk about the evaluation findings and lessons learned for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So Vijaya, please. Thank you, Jim. I wish to thank you like, for organizing this and the opportunity to share uh, the lessons from uh, UNDP evaluation. Uh, I can't agree more uh, uh, with what uh, uh, Andy just mentioned about the book's important contribution it has done to the scholarship in environment as well as evaluation. Uh, so um, uh, I would really urge everyone to take a look at the book. They're very interesting chapters uh, drawing from uh, different evaluations. I'm going to look at some lessons from um, uh, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction program uh, of in UNDP uh, and the importance of the synergies between the two for sustainable development. Uh, this is discussed in the chapter titled Evaluating Disaster Risk Management in the Face of Climate Change in the book you have edited. Um, the chapter draws uh, from three global thematic evaluations carried out by UNDP Independent Evaluation Office. Um, and before going into the lessons, um, I would like to uh, share my thoughts on where we are on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in the SDG discussions uh, and the proposed SDG goals. Uh, uh, what is the progress we made? Uh, uh, looking at them, I, uh, uh, one of the thoughts which occurred to me was that uh, since the Rio summit, um, uh, we've been um, uh, constantly talking about the same issues uh, and um, constantly looking at the progress we made. Uh, the issues seem to be uh, actually um, uh, getting uh, graver in terms of intensity, but the progress seems to be not that much. Um, uh, to, to start on a more positive note, in the past decade, uh, at least uh, uh, one of the positive changes is the uh, acknowledgement of the role of climate change in natural, uh, natural disasters and the importance of red reducing interrelated vulnerabilities. In 2007, the Bali Action Plan negotiations have highlighted vulnerability and disaster risk reduction as key elements of uh, climate change adaptation. Although uncertainty remains, uh, uh, uncertainty over exact magnitudes of changes in temperature and precipitation remains an issue, it's increasingly evident that variability is more likely to increase the frequency of extreme weather events both slow and rapid onset disasters. There is an acknowledgement that disaster events are likely to become more frequent or more intense due to climate change. And the poor people, like you have mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, who are least resilient uh, will be more affected. Despite such acknowledgement, did we do, uh, uh, did we do enough about, uh, about it at all in the past uh, two decades? Um, according to the recent 2015 Global Risk Assessment, uh, by UN uh, International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, uh, we continue to be, I mean, the, uh, uh, the situation is continues to be alarming. Losses are expected to increase in the future uh, unless disaster risks and its drivers such as climate change adaptation, climate change issues are managed more successfully. Uh, expected annual losses, according to the report, uh, are now estimated at uh, US dollars 314 billion. Uh, in built environment alone, an average of 42 million um, uh, human life years are lost in disasters each year, and this is even increasing. But the burden is even more on uh, lower income countries. Uh, of all the life years lost, more than 80% are lost in low and middle income countries. Uh, the negative effect on agricultural productivity, water, and other natural resources uh, uh, will have disproportionate impact on the livelihoods of poor in developing countries. In most cases, climate change will increase the risk of disaster loss. Despite such risk, uh, with a few exceptions, the progress in addressing uh, climate change and disaster risk in natural, uh, national development plans uh, have been very modest. Uh, while most countries uh, are signatories to the Kyoto Protocol and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, environment management, climate change adaptation, and disaster risk reduction are yet to be integrated in national development plans of countries, especially those uh, 
especially uh, most vulnerable to impacts of climate change. Hugo framework of action um, uh, report uh, reporting constantly point to point to this limitation. Will things change with the adoption of SDGs? Uh, um, I think we are at uh, we are now at a very interesting juncture uh, with tremendous opportunities to integrate the objectives of various frameworks on disaster risk reduction and climate change into sustainable development goals um, uh, to be adopted in September this year. Uh, this year, two uh, disaster risk reduction uh, uh, frameworks were adopted, post-2015 framework for disaster risk reduction and, um, uh, um, and the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015-2030. Uh, we, we all know that Hugo Framework for Action 2005-2015 uh, will soon come to an end, and then we have revised version of this. Uh, but uh, I would like to very quickly uh, uh, point to some of the similarities, uh, some of the synergies, at least the post-2015 uh, framework for disaster reduction adopted early this year uh, has with the uh, SDG, proposed SDG goals uh, and targets. For example, SDG Goal uh, uh, 11 on um, uh, safe cities um, and Goal 3 on health, particularly the third focus, um, uh, very closely uh, uh, linked with the post-2015 framework on disaster risk reduction, which is a very positive thing. Um, and SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that focus on sustainable practices to mitigate the impacts of human activity on climate, including Goal 2, 8, 11, 12, and 14 are synergetic again with the post-2015 uh, uh, disaster risk reduction framework. Um, as you all know, disaster risk and resilience received insufficient emphasis in the original uh, Millennium Development Goals agenda. So SDGs, even in the present form, is a step forward. What remains to be seen is how it's operationalized at the country level. A subject of debate um, and contention uh, in arriving at the Sustainable Development Goals uh, is which element of the uh, climate issue uh, should be included and how far the framework should go uh, in recommending action. Currently, the Sustainable Development Goals on climate change uh, in the latest draft is not clear on when and how governments must take action or guiding principles for climate action. While an urgent need to promote low carbon development and cut emissions globally in a fair and equitable manner is widely recognized uh, by a number of countries. But there was no agreement on targets that limit global warming or targets to expand uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. The key point is that um, uh, given how important climate change is for disaster risk reduction and development, the mainstreaming of climate change across the framework and embedding concrete actions to address the impact of climate change on poor and vulnerable communities should be non-negotiable. At this stage, it's not clear how this will be approached. Uh, I'll now um, um, uh, share with you some lessons from the UNDP evaluations, uh, uh, which is uh, discussed in the chapter in the book. Uh, one of the issues uh, that came up repeatedly in three of the evaluations we carried out, that is the evaluation of uh, UNDP support to environment management, uh, evaluation of UNDP support to poverty environment nexus, and evaluation of the UNDP support to disaster risk reduction, um, is that um, support to climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction and environment are always in silos and as standalone areas of work and not adequately integrated into development and poverty reduction initiatives. Although development organizations such as UNDP supported poverty reduction, environment, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, uh, which has comparable, go comparable goals, uh, but these are done simultaneously. There were always separate streams of support. While there is a recognition that climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction are development issues, and were critical in achieving Millennium Development Goals, synergies were not adequately explored. Agencies uh, uh, such as UNDP, which works in different areas, of different critical areas, are in a better position to demonstrate uh, through its programs uh, the critical urgency of integrating, uh, 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 integrating these issues in development planning. But this opportunity is not always maximized. While links are made between disaster risk reduction, poverty, and sustainable environment, and climate change adaptation, there is no operational framework for integrating cross-cutting cross issues into program areas. 
both in terms of planning as well as in implementation. The evaluation points that development organizations need a coherent program approach um, uh, to addressing complex policy programming and partnership issues that would necessitate integrating prog integrated programming. A great deal of the information, analytical tools, risk maps, and organizational capacity developed uh, through disaster risk reduction programs, which have direct relevance in adapting to climate change, are not fully maximized. In the adaptation and disaster risk reduction areas, independent of each other, the programs, however, contributed to outcomes in reducing risk and vulnerability. Furthermore, funding and programming arrangements have contributed to subtle and guarded boundaries between climate change and disaster risk uh, reduction programming. I'll come, come, to, uh, come in a minute to the climate change financing issue. But the countries included in the evaluation have different levels of vulnerability to climate change. For example, uh, for Colombia, India, Mexico, climate change is, is one of the many challenges. For Tanzania, climate change significantly impacts agriculture and livelihood, while for Maldives, it threatens the very future of the country. In all countries, the anticipated impact of climate change will likely to be superimposed over the existing climate-related disasters. This superimposition is particularly true for countries with a large population living in arid regions or in coastal areas. While adaptation projects are designed to uh, decrease vulnerability to climate change impacts, what is needed is integrating them into development planning. We have some good examples to draw from. For example, in Maldives, Bangladesh, the disaster risk reduction and adaptation linkages are well established by the government through its development plan. But such examples uh, are uh, an exception. Although most governments acknowledge the need for synergies between the two areas, both at the conceptual level as well as in program implementation, concrete efforts towards this end are in early stages. Strategies and programs to address climate change risks and natural disasters have links to many sectors and therefore needs cross-sector approaches in addressing interrelated risks. Considering that environment, climate change adaptation, and risk reduction activities tend to be spread across uh, different government agencies, it often showed uh, uh, the pace, uh, it did not show the pace of uh, uh, needed uh, in integrated programming. Reducing and managing climate risk is an issue of decision making in development planning and public investment. It's a, it's a governance issue and not an environment or climate change issue. Uh, the resources required to reduce and manage climate-related risks are fundamentally uh, mainstream development resources. Climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction are not effective when implemented as add-on projects in either the development or civil defense sectors, and uh, uh, when it's diverse from mainstream development. Evidence shows that private, uh, public, and civil society organizations do not become sustainable if they're created solely to implement a project and that standalone projects uh, uh, do not contribute to sustainable development. A related issue in climate change adaptation and development program uh, divide is the climate financing. Increase uh, in financing for climate issues, particularly adaptation, is perceived as eating into development funding. Some of the resistance to adaptation programs is partially due to this. In the case of uh, disaster risk reduction, there is limited financing for integrating disaster risk reduction in development planning when compared to financing for standalone disaster risk reduction initiatives. The evaluation points that uh, rather than creating new adaptation institutions that may increase uh, the disconnect between uh, risk reduction and management on the one hand and development planning and public investment on the other, it's important to integrate climate-related risk management and reduction into existing development institutions and processes and planning. Uh, we need to constantly keep revisiting the question of how can we uh, ensure sustainable development beyond reaching development targets while both accounting for current and future risks. There are some operational challenges as well. In most countries, the evaluations point that environment, climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction activities tend to be spread across different government agencies. In addition, national frameworks for implementing the UNFCCC and um, Hugo Framework for Action are separate with different ministries responsible for each activity. 
coordination has been limited in most countries, despite in, uh, intersectoral task forces. Though governments acknowledge the need for synergies between the two areas, both at the conceptual level as well as program implementation, concrete efforts to this end are rare. There are a few uh, programs that provide useful lessons in integrating uh, integrated programming in UNDP. Um, also, uh, in terms of organizational restructuring, UNDP is m moving more towards uh, an integrated approach to sustainable development. I'll be happy to share these examples uh, during the discussion. In conclusion, uh, I wish to mention that the sustainable development goals cannot be achieved without uh, managing disaster risk reduction and drivers such as uh, climate change adaptation, and we need to learn from the lessons of the past uh, two decades. Uh, the overall focus of disaster risk management, therefore, has to shift from shielding social and economic development against what are seen as external events and shocks to one of transforming development to manage risk sustainable, uh, sustainably, uh, seize opportunities to strengthen resilience, thereby ensuring a sustainable development. Public policies, in my view, should go beyond reducing existing risk and should also prioritize the prevention of new risk accumulation. It is therefore important climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction are considered as cross-cutting themes of sustainable development goals, accompanied by resource commitments in national planning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Vijaya. So now we're going to give the, going to give the floor to Arad Hawk and our commentator today. I hope I pronounced the name correct. <laughs> Arad is the Deputy Director of the Independent Evaluation Office at UNDP. Prior to this, Arad served as the UN Secretary for nearly 10 years as Chief at the Inspection and Evaluation Division of the UN Office of Internal Oversight, supervising a large range of thematic and program evaluations considered by the Secretary General, the General Assembly, and the specialized oversight bodies. Previously, he was also an independent monitor, monitoring and evaluation advisor to various UN agencies and the World Bank. He was a partner co-recipient of the World Bank President's 2002 Team Excellence Award for its contribution as M&E advisor to the Uganda Poverty Reduction Strategy Credit Program. Arad holds a PhD in Management Science. Arad, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Jin, uh, in coming to this role, uh, let me... First of all, thank uh, you half for vacating the chair I'm sitting in. <laughs> <laughs> allow me also uh, allow me also to give uh, credit in passing uh, to fellow UNDP uh, contributors uh, to the book, Roberto uh, Larover and Alan Fox, who wrote chapters respectively on the experience of CG IAR and on um, um, aquifer systems, transboundary boundary aquifer systems. I want to leave space for the uh, participants uh, in the spirit of the webinar format. In addition to those online, we've had uh, 12, 15 uh, participants here in the Independent Evaluation Office uh, uh, conference room here in, here in New York. Uh, therefore, I'm only going to ask one question, uh, and, and I'll re re raise it for the contributors to comment on or, or respond to as they uh, see fit. Um, my, I'm coming at this by way of taking note of the observation that <clears throat> the evaluation function, as was raised by Andy and also alluded to by you, uh, is all too frequently framed around particular interventions uh, uh, and to justify uh, interventions or to analyze interventions which do not actually unfold in isolation from much broader uh, spheres of, of action. Uh, you are, uh, referenced uh, $10 billion being the uh, purse of environmental uh, in interventions. At the same time, uh, putting this in the context of $100 billion or m arguably much more of public expenditure that pertains to uh, um, um, economic interests, that uh, pertains to uh, subsidies that for uh, in respect of public goods, public action uh, that also affect the environment. My, my own question then is how can we get the evaluation function to get closer to the nexus of decision making as it pertains to the broader uh, 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 issues than those that have been cast as specifically as environmental interventions. I'll leave that open for the uh, contributors to comment on, uh, respectively to spur uh, further comments uh, from the participants here in New York or in the uh, in, in the online yeah. sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Arad. So you have Indian.
Jia, do you want to respond to actually Aaron's question first, and then we can also open the, the floor to other participants here and also online. So for online participants, if you have any questions, let us know, and we we can uh, and unmute your mic when you speak. So um, any any questions from the room <coughs> online? Well, in the meantime, what what you're thinking about it? So I, I think this is this is a um, very critical theme uh, that came through actually from all of our perspectives. Um, the fact uh, that that we have to look uh, beyond in, uh, individual interventions, and we have to look beyond um, the um, actually even the unintended consequences of. Uh, of, uh, of um, specific interventions. Andy mentioned this uh, issue about how he talks a lot about uh, connectivity, but then he, he mentioned the concept of unrestricted theory of change. And I think that is very important because otherwise if we are only focusing on, on the theory of change that pertains to a particular intervention, we are narrowing it, narrowing our vision um, uh, too much um, to see the big picture. Now, obviously, we evaluate. We are not um, um, researchers in that sense. That we evaluate always in in some context. And and when you work in a place like the GEF Independent Evaluation Office or the UNDP Independent Evaluation Office, the beauty of it is that they are indeed independent. And we are in a position where we can actually define the scope of our evaluations quite broadly and, 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 and in the way that we see best fit. Uh, many evaluators are not in such a good position. And, and I've discussed about this issue with, um, uh, with people I know who say that, yeah, but the client, if you're a consultant, for example, it doesn't, you don't have to be a consultant. Everybody has a client. The client doesn't want to hear about this bigger picture. The client just wants to know whether they, whether their own intervention has um, um, done what it was supposed to do. I think I don't have a firm answer on it, but I think that the, but uh, that as evaluators we have a responsibility to also to to um, educate, if you wish. I don't want to sound arrogant, but to bring these issues to the attention of the client, whoever that may be. And also, um, there's a case to be made for, um, you know, uh, strengthening the independence of evaluation offices. Vijaya, please. Yeah, um, I think to, uh, on this, I fully agree that evaluators have an important role uh, in broadening the perspective of the uh, uh, to look at the big picture but I would uh, uh, in terms of the financing I think the donor the, the those who hold the purse should lead this change uh, because I, I think when the, the receivers of the funds usually tend to focus because uh, because of the smaller and the smaller scope of the intervention uh, but you know um, uh, since you uh, is from the global environment facility uh, they need to lead in terms of encouraging uh, evaluations to look at a broader picture, starting from the global environment that the evaluations themselves, always focusing on not uh, project-focused uh, evaluations, but uh, a bigger one. Uh, and I, I fully agree that organizations such as UNDP should uh, increasingly do that. Um, but the challenge uh, I would like to throw, because uh, you have Andy and several other evaluators are here, uh, is that how do how does one match the expectations uh, of a particular intervention evaluation and the bigger picture? Where does one draw a line? I was very uh, uh, taken by the Andy's presentation, which is so interesting and so persuasive to look at the uh, to look at the broader picture. But where does one draw a line? Uh, to be realistic when we are doing evaluation. Uh, if it's a very small intervention, uh, a project of um, um, a solar energy project of um, um, 30,000, where do we draw a line in terms of uh, doing, um, um, uh, um, uh, looking at the evaluation of the picture? Um, some thoughts would be um, good to hear some of the thoughts on that. Yeah, 
Thank you, Vijaya. So, we'll see any, any actual audience participants if anything you want to share. And in the meantime, Andy, do you also want to say something? Yes, uh, thank you. It's, um, I think it's a, a very important question. I think there are multiple responsibilities, and I think some of these uh, have been mentioned. I think, I think part of it, too, uh, rests with the evaluation field who have not really, who have been fairly complicit in accepting the, the narrower boundaries uh, and uh, haven't really uh, learned or been uh, assertive enough in extending these boundaries. But I, I think the, so I think there are multiple streams of answers in, the, in evaluation practice in the field, in the commissioners, in the, in the large multilateral organizations and the big evaluation uh, uh, units. But I, I think as, a, as an evaluator or as a field, we need to, we need to understand that the evaluation uh, might be a little more uh, rich than the, the simple commissioning, uh, do the research, present a report, and have a management response. And a lot of the change in use of evaluation occurs through the evaluation process, not through the reports. And the evaluation processes provide us, a, a, an evaluator can take advantage of the evaluation processes to, to work with the program or those responsible for the intervention, the policy, to, to extend that frame and come to an understanding of what uh, that the, the, the evaluation will not uh, create undue risk for the intervention through this extension of the frame so that we reach agreements that, okay, our report will focus on this much narrower frame, which are your, your more strict accountabilities and the sort of established uh, theory of change that you're working within. Uh, but we're also going to go on to this more connected territory, so and we'll we'll do this with you, uh, so that you understand it fully, and that you will be able to use the results of this uh, uh, following the evaluation. Or often, I find during the evaluation, they start changing their intervention, and so it's a matter of of, uh, of first of all recognizing that the evaluation process is an important contributor to change. And when, when used well, the evaluation process can mitigate the risk to the program of expanding the frame of this unrestricted theory to, to connectivity and the unrestricted theory of change uh, and provide really important uh, knowledge to the program, uh, but do so in a way that is uh, engaging the program in that knowledge process so that the the questions addressed in the knowledge process is regarded as salient and legitimate, and they're more likely to use it. So I think while we're waiting for the evaluation world to change and for the multilaterals and the bilaterals to expand their frames, uh, we can still do a lot by engaging uh, with, our, with, our, with the programs in the evaluation and through the evaluation process. Thank you, Andy. Anyone in the room want to share any thoughts, questions? Yeah, please go ahead. If you can also tell us your name and organization. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it's Dorothy Lux here. I'm um, the secretary of the uh, IOCE um, and also an eval partner. Um, and I have a question that, uh, that's been a very interesting discussion. I'd just like to add uh, a little bit to it is that um, I've recently done a, a major evaluation of uh, very large scale catchment and it was uh, focused on a program. Um, but we were very aware of the wider context and the connectedness of the fact that there was a major urban area, et cetera. So the way we handled it was actually going back to the, the old fashioned assumptions um, that tended to be done in the old log frame. Um, and in the evaluation plan, we spent a little bit of time working on, well, what are the assumptions that we're working on within the context? And then we were able to test the assumptions a little bit 
So that opened the door for discussion, not only on the programme, but on the basis on which the programme was being designed uh, as an input to the, the next five years of programming. So that's just a very practical. Yes, thank um, you. Yeah. The, the question I had was really for you, ha, in terms of the, um, the discussion about the SDGs and the fact that there is more of a focus on review rather than evaluation. And you indicated a little bit of hope there that there was going to be uh, a shift towards evaluation. but. A lot of the um, discussions going on at the moment are much more on um, review against the monitoring targets, not against the learning evaluation, the feedback loops, the link back in de to decision making. So in terms of uh, environmental evaluation, this is really critical to combat some of those aspects that you were talking about. What more can be done? to strengthen evaluation in the whole SDG process. Thank you, Dorothy. You had, do you want to answer the question? I uh, wish I could. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just first comment on your, on your first part of it, your watershed um, or catchment area uh, evaluation. I think that's, uh, uh, I think that is, one of the best ways of uh, going about of the, uh, about these things, and and I I would understand that the unrestricted theory of change uh, kind of thing um, refers actually to similar issues. And in in the GEF evaluation office, we've um, developed an approach a few years ago, which is called which we call ROTI, uh, which is uh, basically a review from outcomes to impact. Um, Vijaya is uh, very keen on roti, actually. So there, the whole idea has been indeed that when you when you um, evaluate an inter intervention, you can only evaluate it until your uh, until the outcomes. But then you construct the theory of change. What w will have to happen beyond? Uh, the outcomes for the impacts to materialize, and then you actually really look into the um, uh, assumptions and the risks and, and what, what has to happen. So it's a similar approach uh, as what you had taken in your catchment, I think. Um, on the SDGs, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's very um, difficult in some ways. and. Um, I was part of some of the earlier discussions when I was still with UNDP and, and UNEG on, on, uh, with the UN Secretariat about how to bring in evaluation into the SDGs. And some of my colleagues know much more about it than I do. Um, um, there is a lot of sympathy for the idea, uh, even from the point of view of um, the Secretariat and the, and the um, the Secretary General's uh, crew, so to say. But then, like one of the high officials said, that the evaluation smacks too much of um, accountability. And, and that obviously is, is one, one area where, uh, where there is resistance. Nobody wants to be actually accountable for achieving um, the, um, any goals that are set from the outside. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's an advocacy thing. I think we have to really to uh, work with all parties to explain that you know that it's not really there to um, to uh, to um, I'm about to say hold you accountable, but to but to <laughs> to 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 basically to understand better how we can move towards and um, achieving uh, these goals and what what are what are the um, barriers to their uh, success and so forth? I mean, the point is there that uh, evaluation helps us to understand things, why things happen or don't happen, whereas uh, indicators are very unsatisfactory answer. Yes. Uh, 
I'm sorry, no answers. <laughs> Thank you, Yuha. And actually, we also have In Zhang that do the director of the uh, UNDP Independent Evaluation Office here. I'm, I'm sure he has a lot of insights to, to, to share. Not so much an insight. Just congratulations, Yuha, for one the publication of the book, and we're beginning to see it take a life of its own now. And mm -hmm. also for the excellent presentation, also Andy and Vijaya, uh, and Abel for the uh, pertinent questions. Uh, mine is not so much a, uh, a comment, but an observation and reflection that we need to take uh, into account. Um, it's important for us now to integrate the environmental dimension in all of the evaluations we do in a much more concrete and substantial way. Uh, we haven't done so, and I think this book and this discussion will help us to do so, most certainly from the perspective of this office. Uh, uh, apart from the fact we have many environmental evaluators in the office, uh, we will, as we look at our indicators, uh, bring this dimension very much uh, a center stage. Just thank you for that. You will begin to see that happening. Thank you, Ying Zhang. So, any more, any more thoughts, comments, questions? We haven't could I, heard could I, uh, anyone on the online yeah. yet. Please. I'm not sure if you. I'm sorry, who is the person? I'm sorry. John? Go ahead. You you would talk and then we can see you on the screen. Go ahead and just speak. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Dickman. I'm with the MasterCard Foundation. This was a fabulous presentation. I've ordered the book. I'm looking forward to reading it in more depth. Um, I had two quick questions. One was on this idea of the unrestricted theory of change. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to mainstream and integrate theories of change in all of our work. Um, that's been a struggle, but it's been very useful. If I start talking about unrestricted theories of change, I might become even less popular. <laughs> so I wanted some idea of what that looks like uh, concretely um, and, and what, what is added to the, the um, more traditional theories of, of change format. Uh, and how we might integrate integrate that in a practical way um, around interventions that are somewhat bounded, um, as well as evaluation assignments as we've discussed. And then my second point or question uh, built on the, the latest comment related to how can we see uh, environmental standards or, or elements mainstreamed into other evaluations of, of of other sectoral areas in a more consistent way. Uh, and I'm thinking of the way that uh, gender is now often um, a, a requirement, uh, something that's looked at. I'm thinking of the OECD DAC criteria and other evaluation standards and criteria that are out there. Um, and it, I can see it cutting both ways because in, in a way it's great that, that gender is also often there uh, to be looked at. But often evaluators or commissioners um, don't have quite the depth of understanding of, of what the dimension entails in terms of looking at it in a um, structured and thoughtful way. And so it, it does sometimes become something that's a tick box or is, um, is not looked at with as much depth or, or um, conceptual framing as one would, would have desired. Uh, so. Maybe that question is a little bit less clear, but how, how could one mainstream an environmental uh, element in, in a way that has meaning and, and purpose uh, in, in other sectors? Thank you, Joe. Andy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. First? yeah. Um, I can address both, and I hope coherently and succinctly uh, and usefully. Um, I think, this, let me take the second one first, which is how we mainstream. Uh, I think there are a couple of dimensions to this. I think it's time, the time is right for us to start incorporating sustainability into evaluation standards. And you see, this, there's two types, uh, two approaches to sustainability. There's sustainable, sustainability of the intervention. That means that there is a way that the, the intervention will be carried on by others. Uh, other funding sources by community or whatever. So, the, you know, we're just not there having a pilot or a, as, long as, as long as the World Bank is funding it there and then it, 
it disappears. And then there's sustainable intervention, which is really the nexus intervention that we're talking about. And I think are both are important. OECD DAC criteria sort of uh, include the sustainability of intervention. Uh, and uh, the Canadian uh, Evaluation Society um, capacities uh, work sort of includes that too, but nobody really includes sustainable interventions yet. Uh, the, so no one is really including into the standards. And I think the time is right where we start, where we should be able to uh, press uh, OECD DAC, the American Evaluation Association, Canadian. Um, I'd like to see uh, IOCE and Eval partners uh, start working on this. Uh, and I'd like to see the other UN agencies uh, start the non-environmental agencies started incorporating it. Uh, for example, UN women, uh, women and children are the most vulnerable to climate change and most, uh, their, their survival and subsistence is most contingent on natural resources. Yet uh, UN women is rather behind the times of incorporating uh, nexus or natural, natural systems in, into their work. Uh, so I, th I think it's a, it's a, it's a pushing, it's a pulling, but I think the time is right because I, I do think that sustainability is undeniably on the agenda, even those who, who would rather ignore it. Uh, so that would be where I go. Mainstream is very difficult. Uh, gender is supposed to be mainstream, but I don't really see gender mainstreamed in, in most of the multilateral international work I, I do. I see it uh, given, a, given a place, but far from mainstream. And climate change is even further behind. On on the issue of the unrestricted theory of change, uh, in some ways it's it's good to have the concept, but not to talk publicly about the concept too much, because as you say, it just makes makes the world uh, worse. But I think we I've already suggested that working within the evaluation process, treating evaluation process, uh, is a uh, is a way that individual evaluators and evaluations can do it. But I also like to flag some tools that are rather useful that the evaluation field is not generally embraced or not embraced at all. One is simulation modeling. Uh, simulation modeling can allow us to go on to data poor settings and, and leap over uh, the boundaries of theory of change and talk about the implications and do simulation quite quickly and easily. Another one that is probably more more comfortable is the, is the whole work on scenarios, the use of scenarios as a way of taking people exploring with the program and with the with the various interests in the intervention about what the extended effects, what the unrestricted effects, where the intervention goes, uh, or where it should go and where it doesn't go. So these are tools, and I've developed a rapid impact evaluation that is a form of expert judgment that that does this does basically the same thing. Lets us go on to these territories without investing a huge amount in information gathering and without forcing the uh, forcing a discussion about changing the theory of change and forcing discussion about changing the evaluation framework, but just let us go on to that territory as part of the evaluation process. So I think there's a lot we can do while we're waiting for institutional change. Thank you. With respect to both your questions. Thank you, Andy. Vijaya and Yuha, do you want to, and Aaron, do you want to add anything? No, Yuha? Well, I, I, you know, I, I could say just, um, first of all, I, I appreciated those questions very much, and I also fully agree with Andy. Um, somehow, I mean, these are uh, processes that take long time, like the uh, mainstreaming thing, and now, uh, for example, there's been an agreement in the UN that basically gender and human rights consideration should be um, mainstreamed into into all evaluations. And I personally hope that we will move into a situation where uh, where um, sustainability in the broader sense of, uh, that uh, Andy mentioned is also mainstreamed. And, and I think that we haven't um, opportunity now that the sustainable development goals are coming, it, it will be very, very difficult for the UN, for example, to ignore sustainable development if, if, if everything is organized around uh, SDGs. Um, 
And just a, maybe a footnote on it is that it, it, many of these things actually start by being kind of a, like uh, safeguards. Do no harm. That's the first principle. And then, of course, then you have to move from uh, do no harm to actually to actively thinking about things and, and actively um, doing good. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Yuha. Any any more questions, thoughts? Okay. I guess we are reaching the end of our event. <laughs> but we get we definitely probably can find another opportunity to continue our conversation on value aging environment and sustainable development in the future. And thank you very much, Yuha and the Vijayan Arat, and thank you everyone for your participation. I would like also to thank my colleagues, Anish and Serva. You didn't see them, but they are the people behind the scenes. So thank you. Thank, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll post this event online. Great.